Let's start with the next session. So to split thematically, but it's going to be three pages again to take us through to lunch. And we're starting with Anna and Selva. We'll be talking further about somnambulism in medical dictionaries. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, OK, I'm going to start with a word I, I love. Dormitology. I found it in Sasha Hanley's excellent book, Sleep in Early Modern England. Uh, she's a wonderful historian and she uses this recent coinage. And she explains that it designates the incredible amount of sleep related scholarly work that's been coming out um, in different fields, um, medical anthropology, neurosciences, sociology, uh, human geography, and as far as I'm concerned, terminology. So what I'm going to show you today is, first of all, modern day classification of sleep disorders. That's going to give us a background, like a concept, general conceptualization of the specialized domain, so we can then look back and see what was happening in the 18th century. Um, so I'm going to give you my aims specifically. I'm going to tell you about the corpus. I am going to tell you about my MO. I'm not using the word methodology on purpose. I'm going to tell you exactly what I did step by step. That's what I'm interested in. Um, and then, of course, that's going to lead to the actual analysis of the corpus. And then I'm going to draw conclusions, preliminary conclusions, OK, because there is a lot still that needs to be investigated and taken into account. All right. So this is a start. I'm actually trying to write a book on this. Don't tell anybody. Um, but yeah. So um, this is preliminary and I am not a sleepwalker, by the way. That's not why I'm interested in this. I'm interested in this because of John William Polidori, Byron's doctor, the author of The Vampire. He wrote his graduation thesis on somnambulism. I found I found out I read it and I was done for. So you take it up to him if you find him. <laughs> All right. So sleep disorders today, sleep medicine is a field of medicine today. It's a it's interdisciplinary. It's it's very complex. What I refer to is the reference textbook, which is the International Classification of Sleep Disorders, the third edition specifically. And what we know today has allowed us to. Identify seven different categories of sleep disorders. I know it's impressive. Um, that being said, what I wanted to find in 18th century medical dictionaries was parasomnias. Parasomnias has three subcategories. One of those is non REM related sleep disorders. Sleepwalking is one of the manifestations of non REM related sleep disorders. That's just to give you a background to what I'm talking about. Now, my point was. OK, so sleepwalking, non REM related sleep disorders. How are these? Lexicalized in 18th century <coughs> medical dictionaries. Um, how are they conceptualized? Because the two go together. Obviously, the conceptualization and the lexicalization go together. My approach, I need to tell you, is not lexicographic. So I'm not going to tell you about entry structure, about entry contents specifically. Uh, that's Elisabetta for you. That's what she does. <laughs> so I'm not doing that specifically. I am looking at the lexical items. And what kind of concept they underlie, what kind of um, organization of the conceptual domain they tell us about. That's going to be clearer when I continue, but just to give you a reference, I'm using uh, ISO references for um, terminology theory in particular. When I talk about a concept, I talk about a unit of knowledge created by. A unique combination of characteristics, and when I talk about a term, I talk about the designation that represents that concept in linguistic terms and big word ontology. Uh, in terminology theory, ontology is the hierarchical organization of concepts and lexical representations within a specialized domain of knowledge. That is what I'm interested in. 
and that is what I'll try to do today. OK, my corpus is made up of the four medical dictionaries that you see um, on the slide. Um, I selected these specifically for the following reasons. Chronology, I was interested in the, in the 18th century specifically, so I left out some late 17th century medical dictionaries because during the 18th century, well, first of all, the medical reform happened. So epistemologically, the field of medicine changed, medical practice changed, um, and it became, eventually, it would become regulated by law in the early 19th century. So um, it's a huge century made up of changes, language changes as well, um, in the course of the 18th century. And that was my first reason, also because interest in sleepwalking uh, increased in the course of the 18th century, as per Sasha Handley's marvel marvelous book. So there was a growing interest in sleepwalking in trans states that would eventually reach uh, romanticism and produce, I mean, be included in a lot of literary works, the vampire being one, but Frankenstein being another. Um, so chronology was the first reason. Genre was the other reason, that's a slippery word, especially when it comes to the 18th century, especially when it comes to dictionaries. Uh, LSP lexicography, as we know it today, just wasn't happening in the 18th century, okay? So by genre, I mean kind of a Klein, in Halliday's sense of the word. So you have kind of a continuum. At one end, you have encyclopedic um, dictionaries. On the other hand, you have more linguistic dictionaries, so containing definitions, etymology, synonyms, and that's it. And in between, you have different gradations, okay? So I see these dictionaries as belonging to this sort of continuum where they present varying degrees of the same characteristics. So they're all a bit encyclopedic, they're all a bit linguistic dictionaries, they, they all contain different degrees of, of um, detail. Um, language is the other thing. I didn't take into consideration any translations. OK, so no dictionaries that were translated into English. Um, now, what did I do? Uh, you see all these words there. Obviously, I wasn't since I wasn't working from a lexicographic perspective, sampling um, theories and sampling techniques were not relevant to me. So I had to come up with a list of keywords, a list of um, head words that I would actually look up. Um, so what I referred to was, first of all, um, some nominalism related literature. There has been um, a lot of interest, as I said at the beginning, and in some nambulism related literature, you could find several synonyms, several several lexicalizations, such as coma vigil, such as somnambulismus, so the, lat the Latin bit, oniridenia, which is um, the preferred term um, in the second half of the uh, 18th century. So some headwords I selected from there. The rest I selected um, looking at medical reference works. So I was looking at somnambulism in William Cullen's nosology, in Erasmus Darwin's zoonomia, and in John William Polidori's thesis. So I had other um, lexicalizations of somnambulism that I could rely on, and I came up with um, the list. Um, you will find some some strange stuff like hallucination. How is that connected to somnambulism? But it was in reference works. The two were somehow linked. Or visania, or visania. These were mental illnesses, and they were. Um, and actually, William Cullen, he categorizes oniridenia as being a part of a visania. Okay, so I wasn't just looking for relevant headwords, so headwords that would be sleepwalking, sleepwalker, somnambulist, um, somnambulism, so not just the expected stuff, but lexical items that would be cross-referenced in a way and somehow connected and conceptualized within um, somnambulism, if that makes any sense. So let's start with John Quincy. John Quincy, um, uh, published his dictionary in 719. It's a dictionary 
that Rod McConkie um, calls a dictionary with a Newtonian agenda. So it's, it's very much based on physics and empiricism, and this shows in the entries. Not much interest, in fact, in somnambulism. You get an entry for coma, and by that we mean sort of um, hypersomnolence, um, so not a coma as we intend it today. You have, very interestingly, the entry narcotic, which one would expect has got to do with opium and, 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 and drugs of any kind, and no, it doesn't. It's what I call is er conceptual entry for sleep and anything that's sleep related. So he does not have an entry for sleep specifically. Everything, all the information that he wants to include in the dictionary and that is sleep related goes under that heading, under that headwork, the headword narcotic. So he describes physiological sleep, so how it works. And then he uh, talks about you know, narcotics actually, so substances that influence sleep and sleep patterns. You find um, these words as well, somniferous, somnolency, soporiferous, none of them refer to sleep disorders in any way. That's the thing. So the only thing that seems to point in that direction is incubus. Uh, so he says that incubus is well he describes it he says it's nightmare and he explains that it comes from a disturbed imagination and a distemperance of thought uh, and that's as far as he goes and that's it so this is the only um reference to sleep disorders that i could find things change with robert james robert james is the author of um a very encyclopedic dictionary which aims to represent current medical knowledge as well as historical medical knowledge so his entries are not merely linguistic there's a lot of historical information quotes from hippocrates uh, galen borhave uh, so there's a wealth of information there that's relevant coma once again hypersomnolence. Uh, lethargus is interesting. Um, I, I pronounce Latin the Italian way, so you'll forgive me for that. Um, uh, lethargus is, is interesting in the sense that he gives a very detailed description of lethargus and the different degrees of intensity of lethargus. We are interested in carus, actually, which is subdivided into three further categories. And carus number two, is what we like because it's a reference to sleep disorders in the sense that when you have the second type of carus you sleep all the time you're you're um asleep you're difficult to wake you do wake interact fall asleep again and when the episode is over you don't remember waking up and interacting so that goes into the direction of somnambulism in a way. It's not necessarily um, sleepwalking, but it's abnormal behavior during sleep, which would be your definition of parasomnia as going back to modern day categorizations. So this is an indication. You've got incubus again, nightmare, sense of oppression on your chest, uh, a, feeling, a feeling of weight on your chest, but no uh, specific indications of anything else. You've got nomina gentis, so noctambulo, somnambulo, somebody who walks in their sleep, okay? Well, they would say in his sleep, but um, yeah. And the usual somnifera, somnium, somnolencia, somnus, so all the sleep-related words, but no pathology, no disorder indicated in there. You do have Vesania, but at this point, Vesania is not connected to sleepwalking in any way. That's going to come later on. Um, it is um, connected with um, love madness. That's the definition. Um, Carus, yes, I told you about it. Now, John Barrow, John Barrow, poor thing. He was, uh, from a linguistic point of view, I think he did great work in the sense that he compiled a linguistic dictionary. So what you have in his dictionary is definitions, etymology, synonyms, 
that's it. So it's it's portable. Robert James's was was huge. John Barrow was trying, I think, to be sellable in 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 a way. But pardon, um, I mean, forgive the contemporary expression, but he was aiming for a different type of public. OK, a different type of audience. He is, in fact, uh, he in fact produced a derivative work. OK, his dictionary was very much modeled on Robert James's. So there's no news to speak of. You have coma, you have letargus, you have incubus, you have narcotica, which once again, narcotics. Uh, you have noctambulo, nomina gentis. This is the interesting thing because this is the one thing that shows up in his dictionary and I can find in other dictionaries noctisurgium to designate somnambulism. And this is one of the things that I want to look into. Um, and I haven't yet, but it's um, something that I really want to look into. You have the usual here. Let's come to my favorite, George Motherby. He, uh, um, OK, his great um, achievement is the fact that he was very well read in contemporary medicine. So his dictionary is up to date, if you will. Um, and I mentioned William Cullen before. Uh, and his nosology, which was published in 1769. Motherby openly refers to Colin only six years later. That's how up to date he was. So that's impressive, um, I would say. Um, and predictably, there's a lot of sleep disorders in his dictionary. Um, the usual instead of spelling it out as carus he uses the variant carus but then in the entry he actually writes carus as well so there's there's a bit of um yeah there's these two spelling variants there this is the other thing i want to look into because i can't find it anywhere else hypnobatis which would be a nomina gentis for sleepwalker and i don't really know where he got it from um it's obviously of greek origin uh but but I, I need to look into this, like where did that word come from, who was using it, et cetera, et cetera. So that's future work for me. You've got Incubo, and this is where the connection with Cullen, the connection with medical advancements and medical theory uh, that was contemporary comes in. He defines Incubo as Oniridenia gravans. Cullen um, conceptualized two types of Oniridenia. One was onairodinia uh, activa, which was actual sleepwalking. Onairodinia gravens was incubus, nightmare, that feeling of oppression on your chest. So he openly refers to Cullen and to onairodinia. Narcotica, noctambulatio, and noctambulo, somnambulo, somnambulatio, once again, types of onairodinia. So he openly refers to Cullen's designation for the um, for the disorder. Uh, somnium, that would be dream, somnus, okay. Vesania, this time he refers to Vesania as Cullen defined Vesania, so mental illnesses, all right? So his um, designations for sleep disorders of various kinds come from Cullen's work and Cullen's classification of diseases, which makes mother bees probably the most uh, conceptually organized, the most ontologically sound. Um, of, of the four um, lexicographers I, I discussed. Now, preliminary conclusions. Well, first of all, what we find in dictionaries is not just parasomnias, which was my interest. You find a lot about central disorders of hypersomnolence. So you find a lot about letargus, you find a lot about coma, about apoplexia. Um, so I found other stuff that I wasn't looking for, but that's that's what happens, right? When you when you work on something, and then other conclusions. Well, Quincy and the Newtonian agenda, as I mentioned, he was interested in what was measurable, if you will. He was interested in signs, in things that were manifest and that the medical practitioner could look at and assess. Uh, so the realm of the imagination, that his temperatures of thought were not really his his thing, his cup of tea. Uh, James's encyclopedic work shows uh, 
more variety, which is in the nature of the work he carried out. Barrow's work was derivative. There's that noctisurgium that I will look into. Um, and finally, Mother Bee is the one who actually shows the growing interest in sleepwalking by presenting the most lexicalizations. So obviously we're not in a situation where the terminology is set, of course. There is a proliferation of lexical items, of synonyms, of pseudo synonyms, and um, it's still a field that needs ordering, terminologically speaking. But Mother B is attuned to uh, current medical advancements and whatever he includes in his dictionary that's sleep disorder related and somnambulism related is based on medical work by William Cullen, which is um, great. This shows, in fact, a growing interest in sleepwalking. You start with Quincy, beginning of the century with very few headwords that are related to sleep, no sleepwalking um, entries proper, and these increase. So the sleep related um, headwords increase in number and somnambulism related words increase in number as the century progresses. Um, I'll keep you posted on whatever else I can find. Thank you very much. Okay, questions, comments, suggestions? Yeah, that was very interesting. Um, in regards to your demo, I mean, it seemed like what you found was already very, very comprehensive, so this might not be of any help. But I know you were talking about oh, what, what, how do you know what to look for in the first place? Um, have you ever thought of maybe looking at the historical thes thesaur the thesaurus in English, um, the sleep home, because that might point you to other Items. Again, it looks like you already found a lot, but maybe you found other yeah, items. That absolutely. Yeah. That's a great suggestion. Thanks. In a similar vein, the, although it's the earlier periods, so it might not be so helpful. There's the lexicons of early modern English poetry. Okay. We may be able to match between dictionary, I guess. That was helpful to me when I was sort of rummaging around with words in the 17th century. <laughs> Uh, unfair question, but um, when we're talking about Mother Reef, the last one, who was sort of, was he condensing Colin? Do you, what do you know about Colin and his work then? Was, was Mother Reef adding onto something or is he really just no. picking out and that sort of? He was, um, yeah, no, he wasn't really adding anything to Colin. He was referring to Colin's work, not necessarily openly, but like he was using the same terminology. Uh, he was very often defining lexical items in Cullen's terms. So, somnambulatio or somnambulism or noctambulation, he would say a kind of onirodenia. Onirodenia is Cullen's word. Okay. Um, and even when he uh, describes Vesanie, he describes them in Cullen's terms. Okay. So, that's, that's what he was doing. He was, he'd read Cullen. And he was using Cullen's terminology. He wasn't adding on to Cullen's work, no. Um, yes, but um, they were working on different genres. Cullen was, was um, Cullen produced a nosology, so a classification of diseases for, for students and for medical practitioners. Um, Mother B was writing a dictionary. So, um, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mention that. I'm sorry, I, ju I just took it for granted. So, sorry, no, that's, that's, uh, that's why uh, Cullen was um, working on a different genre and doing something different. Um, so Mother B used uh, the the treaty, if you want to call it that, um, he sort of scoured for information. That's that's what it was. But it was two genres. Sorry. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to to actually say that. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask you if there's uh, if you uh, uh, if you find a, a strict relationship between uh, some number and dream or. Let's say insomnia and vision, some good vision, since it's a long vision in 
uh, literature in uh, middle English literature as well, and and before and classical uh, sources in these dictionaries. Um, that's a great question. It's once again a different genre. So in, in dictionaries, in the dictionaries I looked at, I couldn't really find the connection. In reference works, I did. So in nosologies, in um, books that try and categorize disease, so medical treaties, yes. Cullen, once again, um, he would, he connected reverie, dream and on iridenia and somnambulism so there were cross references in his work but once again it's not a dictionary but yes there is that sort of fil rouge that that connection that happens yeah you're welcome um, you may limit of course i kept on thinking of it when i reviewed your work but i wonder whether in a way what you're doing could, is framed or could be framed in terms of conceptual history, that you're using the dictionary as a way of yeah. take, carrying out a sort of conceptual history study at a college or something like that. But you're saying within the profession, the conceptual history of this seems to be developing that way. And you did get the concept through the round, we talked about concept. So I just wondered whether conceptual history was a, an, an interesting or important framing. Um, not at this point, no, but um, it can be. <laughs> Obviously, you just give a sort of structuring to, to the observation. The observations are uh, entirely accurate, but I wonder whether you might be able to sort of draw some strength from yeah, that framework. Yeah, absolutely. Quite useful. Okay, in that case, I'd also remind people that they have spare time later today. Do, do, do check the internet first and leave it open. So we're sort of talking about dictionaries, Dr. Johnson's house going yeah. in that direction. Uh, and if you want to sort of pay a pilgrimage to and have a look around to see where he compiles his dictionary, it's still there and they open it most days and you can pop in and have a look around. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you.